You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is, Jacob Volk. Hello! Sports fans! Welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk. And... This is going to be the case for a lot of this month. I'm going to start with baseball. Specifically, I'm going to start with Astros Athletics. And that incredibly topsy-turvy game that we saw yesterday. Being a Yankees fan, I don't see the Dodgers a lot. If they're on late, maybe I'll watch them. If they're the national game, maybe I'll watch them. But I don't see them a lot. The little bit that I've seen of Dodger Stadium, it plays kind of neutral. You know, it's not like Candlestick Park or anything. There's no way on this earth that I could have predicted what happened yesterday. Both teams combined for six home runs. The only thing I can think of is that the air is a little drier during the day so the ball can carry a little bit more. I mean, some of those balls were normal fly balls that just kept carrying and carrying and carrying. And then next thing you know... They're over the fence. Very bizarre. This was a very bizarre game. I give the Astros credit for hanging in there. They're down 3-0 early. They tie it up in the fourth. Bregman and Correa both hit home runs. The Athletics take the lead back. It's 5-3 Athletics after 5. Lance McCullers is ineffective. The Astros' bullpen this year was okay. Not great. Outside of Scrub, Presley, Paredes, and Taylor, no one scares me. But when the top of the sixth rolled around, the Astros turned it on. They outscored the Athletics 7 to nothing. I loved what they did in the top of the sixth, manufacturing those four runs. That was great. I like J.B. Wendelkin, but he was dreadful. The starter was, too, Chris Bassett. He gave up nine hits in four innings. Now, he only gave up three runs, but in four innings, that's not going to work for me. Like I said, before the series started, I think the Astros just have too much firepower. I don't like this matchup for the Athletics. This was their game to win, the Bassett game. Bassett is their best pitcher. And he's better than Lance McCullers. After him, who scares you? Jesus Luzardo? Look, Luzardo looks like he's going to be a really good pitcher in this league for a while, but how much can you really trust him? How much can you really trust Sean Mania? How much can you really trust Mike Fiers? This was the Athletics' best chance to win, and they blew it. It's not looking good for them going forward. 
Moving on now to Yankees Rays. And the Bronx Bombers are back. It was touch and go there for a little bit, but this team is playing great baseball. Garrett Cole was really good. I wouldn't say great. Six innings, three runs isn't great. It's good. It's really good. And Cole's stuff was nasty. I mean, he really only made two bad pitches. Now, granted, they were big home runs, but I can live with only making two bad pitches. The thing is, though, it seems like every start, Cole has given up a home run. You know, I don't care if you're up big, if it's 10 nothing in the sixth inning. Sure, give up a solo shot. Hell, give up a two-run shot or a three-run shot. Those were big home runs. But at the end of the day, it didn't matter much because the Yankees got their big home runs. Frazier in the third to give the Yankees the lead. Higashioka in the fifth to make it um, a one-run game. Aaron Judge in the fifth to tie the game. And then the coup de grace. Giancarlo Stanton, in the top of the ninth, to ice the game. Made it 9-3, forget about it, you can go to bed early, have a good night. I mean, I like John Curtis. I think he's a solid pitcher. He was dreadful here. Holy God. He couldn't get anyone out. He was useless. The Rays had to go to Shane McClanahan to get the final out. This guy had never pitched in the majors before. The first pitcher in Major League Baseball history to make his Major League debut in the postseason. And hopefully this gets the Stanton haters to shut up a little bit. I understand that Stanton needs to keep this up. He can't go over for the rest of the month. But this was a big home run. I don't want to see anyone minimizing it. No. That Grand Slam iced the game. I mean, you could tell all throughout that at-bat that he wanted to go deep. And I don't like when players do that. But it's Giancarlo Stanton... He had a two-run lead, bases loaded, Aroldis Chapman ready to come in, Gio Urshela heading behind you. I can live with that. But Stanton got all of this pitch. I mean, bam, forget about it. That was a no-doubter. He only had one hit in that game, but it was a big one. You know, I understand that Stanton's an easy guy to pick on. Big contract. Gets hurt a lot. Look, he's never going to win MVP again. He's probably never going to hit over 50 home runs again. But he's still, if not great, really, really good. I mean, if you want to tell me that he's not great because he doesn't stay healthy, I can live with that argument. But then answer me this. Is Aaron Judge great? Part of being great is staying healthy. I'm not knocking Judge, but a lot of the criticisms that I hear about Stanton can apply to Judge also. Yankee fans just like Judge more because he's a homegrown guy. And I respect that. But realize that if you were to replace the name Stanton with Judge in your barbs, it would be accurate. I love them both. I have face masks of the both of them. I'm not kidding. I have them, Cole... And Torres. (laughs) That's so sad. Oh, God. 
I wish I could go back to February and just say, stop, we need to take this seriously. Or fast forward five years to get the vaccine recipe and then bring it back so we can get back to normal. Whatever normal's going to be after this. Oh, God. But I'm rambling. I want to talk a little bit about Blake Snell. Snell was useless. Five innings, four runs, not going to work for me. You know, you can't give up two home runs in three at-bats when you're the ace. You can't give up a home run to a guy who's never started a playoff game before and be an ace. Dreadful performance by him. The Rays are going to have a tough go of it going forward because no one that they have is as good as Snell. But I'll get into that in a minute. I want to talk about some of the other games first, namely Marlins Braves. I think what I'm going to do now in previewing MLB games is really dig into the pitching matchups. Because at the end of the day, that's how you win in the playoffs. You can have great hitting, but at the end of the day, if you score 10 runs... You still have to give up 9 or less. If you give up 11, that's all anyone's remembering. I mean, earlier when I was doing this, I was speaking a lot in cliches, repeating myself a lot. I think this is a much better way to do it. So the pitching matchup here is Sandy Alcantara versus Max Freed. Alcantara was... Great against the Cubs. Pitched six and two thirds, only gave up one run, really stifled some good hitters. I know they underachieved this year, but they're still good hitters. He really only has three pitches that he trusts a sinker, a four seamer, and a slider. He likes to use his slider as his strikeout pitch. It cuts in on righties, and they just swing right by it. His sinker, he's really good at painting the outside corner. Very highly thought of prospect for a while. He finally seems to be putting it all together. He had losing records his first two years with the Marlins. This year he went 3-2. and two. I understand that's not a great record, but still, it's a winning record. Baby steps. I like Alcantara. I think he's a really good pitcher. And when you look at Max Freed, this is the guy who's probably going to get my Cy Young vote for the National League. Went 7-0 and with a 2-2-5 ERA. And 50 strikeouts. Likes to throw his fastballs high. Gets a lot of swings and misses with him. And if he doesn't get swings and misses there, it sets up his off-speed stuff. His curve and his slider is deadly. His curveball drops more than any curveball in the majors. Maybe with the exception of Strasburg. Maybe. I mean, that's how he sets you up. Fastball high. You either foul it off or you strike out. If you foul it off, curveball with incredible break. Moving on now to Astros Athletics. Framber Valdez versus Sean Mania, Two lefties going at it. I gotta say, I don't know why Granky isn't getting this start. 
I understand that he wasn't incredibly effective against the Twins, but he's better than Valdez. He's better than McCullers. I mean, if you want to start McCullers, I get it. Has a track record of playoff success, well-rested, I get that. You have to start Granky here. I just don't get it. But when you look at Valdez, this is a guy who relies on off-speed stuff a lot. His fastball usually tops out at 92, 93. It can get into the uh, 95 and above range, but that's kind of rare. He likes to use his sinker a lot, and he likes to use his curveball a lot. Gets a lot of balls in the dirt with the curveball. And the sinker, he gets really good movement on it. It actually reminds me a lot of Zach Britton's sinker. They both get that type of movement. And they're both lefties. I like using that Britton comparison. I did it with Ron Paranowski yesterday. Mr. Britton, you're very versatile. <laughs> oh, I'm in a goofy mood today. I'll tell ya. And when you look at Sean Mania, I like Mania. Decent pitcher. Nothing great, nothing terrible. Four and three with a four five ERA. He's a lefty, so you can live with that. He relies on three pitches his four seamer, his change up, and his curve. The issue with Mania is he doesn't locate his four seamer that well. He'll leave it out over the middle of the plate, and then, bam, forget about it. It's going out of the park. The key for Mania today is going to be location. Location, location, location. Can he locate his pitches? Can he hit the catcher's mitt? If he sets it up where the catcher wants it, he'll have no problem. If not... It's going to be a long day. Moving on now to Yankees Rays. And the decision to start Valdez over Granky is bad. The decision to start Garcia over Tanaka is dreadful. You are putting a Baby, a 21-year-old kid out there in Game 2 of the ALDS when he's only started six games the whole year. Now, he wasn't bad in those six games. He went 3-2 and two with a 4.980 RA. Strikes a lot of hitters out. I like Garcia. I like him a lot. But, his last couple starts, he kind of tailed off a little bit. Was dreadful against the Red Sox. Wasn't all that great against the Marlins. I understand he got the win, but he went six and two-thirds, gave up four runs on seven hits. He struck out seven. It wasn't a terrible start. It wasn't an abysmal start. So you're putting him out there instead of Masahiro Tanaka, your proven playoff performer. A guy who, granted, game two against the Indians didn't set the world on fire, But that's an aberration. Before that start, Tanaka had never not gone five innings in the playoffs. He had never given up more than four runs. The last time he walked three batters in a postseason game 
was the wild card game that he started in 2015 against the Astros. You have to start Tanaka here. I don't want to hear this garbage that, you know, the Rays have Tyler Glasnow going, so, you know, you look to win game three, you give this game to the Rays. No! This is the playoffs! You don't forfeit any games! If that's your point, then why did Cole start against Snell? Don't you want Cole going up against an inferior pitcher? Be consistent. Also, is Glasnow really that much better than Tanaka? Tanaka was good this year. 3-3 three and three with a 3-5-6 ERA. I think he's earned a spot on this team going forward. How do you not reward him by giving him the starting game two? I understand that this isn't a must-win game. And I'd be curious if Boone would have changed his mind if the Yankees had lost yesterday. Because then it would have been a must-win. You don't want to go down 2-0. If you turn it into a best 2 out of 3, it's not the end of the world. It's not an ideal scenario. You'd rather be up 2-0, but better to be tied 1-1 than down 0-2. But when you look at Glass now, he's kind of a weird pitcher. He really only throws two pitches, a fastball and a curveball. He has a changeup that he'll sometimes throw, but he doesn't throw it a lot. The thing with him is he has tremendous location. Great command on his pitches. That's what you love about him. That's what made him such a highly thought of prospect once upon a time. It's why I was screaming when the Rays traded for him. I didn't want to face him. I wanted him in the National League. Let other teams deal with him. And that sequence that he throws, the 97-mile-an-hour fastball with the 83-mile-an-hour curve. It's such a hard sequence as a hitter. You're looking fastball, and then the ball just dies, and you swing right over it. As much as this kills me to say, I think the Rays are going to win this game. I think the Yankees are... Playing for Game 3 and Game 4. I don't like that. I don't think that's a good strategy. I don't like what Boone's doing here. I really don't. And I think the Rays are going to be able to capitalize on it. And it'll be interesting to see how Boone manages if he has to pull Garcia early. Does he go to more high-leverage guys, or does he go to... Guys like Nick Nelson or Michael King. You know, guys like that. It'll be interesting. I'll tell you that. Moving on now to Padres Dodgers. The Padres have not announced a starter. They're still holding out hope that Mike Clevenger can start. Maybe Denelson Lamott too, but... Nothing's been announced yet. So look, the one thing I'll say about the Padres is they need their big guns to produce. I know that sounds cliche, but it's true. Fernando Tatis needs to pull out some more bat flips. Manny Machado needs to produce. Will Myers has had a really good season. Let's see if he can keep it going. Jake Cronenworth has burst onto the scene and has had a really good season. I like Mitch Moreland. Jerickson Profar is getting it together. The Padres have a good lineup. I just don't know how it's going to do against Walker Buehler. This guy is one of the best pitchers in baseball. 
He throws five pitches. He keeps you guessing. You really can't get comfortable against him if you're a hitter. I mean, the thing with Bueller that's really scary is his velocity. His four-seamer can get up to 97, 98. But he also has a cutter that can go to 95. I mean, that cutter is lethal against righties. And the Padres are righty-heavy. So it's going to be a very interesting matchup to watch. These Padres hitters versus Bueller. That's going to be the key to this game. I promise you. Moving on now to Patriots Chiefs. This game was originally supposed to be on Sunday, but both Cam Newton and Jordan Ta'amu tested positive for the coronavirus. So the NFL moved it back a day. I have no idea what the benefit of an extra day is, but whatever. Because Newton couldn't play, the Patriots started Brian Hoyer. And I'll get into how Hoyer played in a minute. But I want to talk about that crazy in-the-grasp call on Patrick Mahomes. How was that in the grasp? The whistle didn't sound. I mean, no one heard it. No one except the referees knew what was going on. I mean, that was nuts. Nick is texting me going nuts. That was so a fumble, it's not even funny. It's kind of good to see a call go against the Patriots for once. Belichick was going nuts. I can't say I blame him. Ultimately, it didn't matter much because the Patriots played like absolute garbage. Brian Hoyer was dreadful. Went 15 for 24, which isn't bad. 130 yards, not bad. But he turned the ball over twice. One interception, one fumble. Took an asinine sack late in the second quarter. Dreadful game. Then the Patriots went to Jared Stidham. The first time Stidham was used in mop-up duty was against the Jets. It was the first Luke Falk game. The Jets lost 30 to 14. They were down 30 to nothing at one point. I was watching the game inside a Yankee Stadium suite. I had the Yankee game in front of me and the Jets game on above me. Awesome setup. The reason I'm telling you this is because Stidham came in in mop-up duty. Somehow, he was even worse than Hoyer. Went just 5 for 13 for 60 yards. The 12 yards per completion is good. I like that. But I don't like the two interceptions. I mean, the touchdown pass to Nikhil Harry made it 13 to 10 Chiefs. So, you know, the Patriots are in it. The Chiefs get another touchdown. Butker misses the extra point. It's 19 to 10 Chiefs at this point. 8.57 left to go in the fourth quarter. Not impossible to come back from. Difficult, but not impossible. You really just can't turn the ball over. The first play from scrimmage, that's what Jared Stidham did. Now look, great pick by Matthew. Love the Honey Badger. Good play. But, the Patriots have an issue. You cannot... Go into that game on Sunday against the Broncos with either Hoyer or Stidham as your starter. For their sake, I hope Cam Newton comes back. Or else it's going to be a long day in Foxborough. 
I mean, Damian Harris was really good. 17 rushes for 100 yards. I like that. But you still need your quarterback to play well. And neither Patriots quarterback played well. Obviously, Mahomes was Mahomes. And Edwards Hilaire was Edwards Hilaire. And this is a good Chiefs defense, too. I didn't realize how good they've been this year. They've limited their opponents to, at most, 20 points. And they've done it against good quarterbacks, too. Deshaun Watson and Lamar Jackson. This is a good Chiefs defense. I'll tell you what. I'm going to say something that should scare the rest of the NFL. The Chiefs defense this year is light years ahead of where it was last year. And the offense may be better. Because Edward Hilaire is better than Damian Williams. The way the Chiefs are playing right now, how can you not pick them to win the Super Bowl? Moving on now to Falcons Packers. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This game was an absolute joke. The Falcons' defense couldn't stop Aaron Rodgers to save their lives. Rodgers threw four touchdowns. Aaron Jones ran all over him. I understand it's the Packers, but this is a terrible trend for the Falcons. I mean, they're 0-4. They have Dan Quinn as their head coach, a supposed defensive genius. The Falcons' defense has been dreadful. Their offense is good. Matt Ryan's good. Todd Gurley's good. The defense is useless. Quinn needs to go. It's just that simple. I mean, I don't know what you're waiting for. He hasn't recovered from 28 to 3. That's ancient history. You've got to be able to move on from that. People got on me for saying that the Falcons are still suffering from that Super Bowl hangover. They are. Ever since that moment, it's been all downhill. Yes, devastating choke job, but you've got to move past it. Quinn is inept. He is a defensive coordinator. That is all he is. He should not be a head coach. He needs to go. And if I had to say it right now through a quarter of the season, it seems like we're looking at a Chiefs-Packers Super Bowl. If Rodgers keeps playing like this, doesn't throw any interceptions, it's going to be Patrick Mahomes versus Aaron Rodgers in the Super Bowl. How does that grab you? Dan Quinn will not be the first head coach fired this year, though. That honor went to Bill O'Brien, who was canned yesterday. There is no question that the Texans have been dreadful this year. Their own four. Bill O'Brien made a disastrous decision to trade DeAndre Hopkins. He made a disastrous decision to trade for Laramie Tunsil. He made some bad decisions as GM. And I can't begrudge the Texans for doing this. Their fans were revolting. You see the Texans offense not playing to its standards. Watson has been good, but the running game has been non-existent. The Texans have averaged the least amount of rushing yards per game in the entire NFL with 73 and a half. And part of that stems from the Hopkins trade when they let Carlos Hyde walk in favor of bringing in David Johnson. Johnson has been dreadful this year. But having said that, while there's no question that Bill O'Brien should not be in charge of personnel. I don't think he's a bad coach. I could see him landing on his feet. 
realize the NFL loves quarterback whispers. That's what O'Brien has done with Deshaun Watson. I'm not saying that O'Brien is the sole reason for Watson being really, 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 really good. But he certainly helped. I mean, this guy led the Texans to 9-7 and seven seasons with guys like Ryan Fitzpatrick, Case Keenum, Ryan Mallett, TJ Yates, and Brandon Whedon under center. In one of those years, 2015, the Texans won the AFC South. Now they got creamed by the Chiefs in the playoffs. They got shut out 30 to nothing. But they still won the division. That does count for something. He made the big move to sign Brock Osweiler. That didn't work. Then Watson came in and changed that whole team. They went from 4 and 12 to 11 and 5. I got to tell you I don't think O'Brien's a bad coach. I don't think he's great. This was the right decision by the Texans. There's no excuse for them to be 0-4, and you can trace it all back to O'Brien's dreadful personnel decisions. But it wouldn't surprise me if he got another head coaching job. Again, the NFL loves quarterback gurus. O'Brien's going to be able to sell teams on what he was able to do with Deshaun Watson. You want to tell me that's not right? I don't care. That's what he's going to do. And teams will listen. Because we live in a world where below average college coaches are getting NFL jobs. Tell me what credentials Cliff Kingsbury really had before making the jump to the Cardinals. Under 500 coach at Texas Tech. Tell me what real qualifications Matt Rule had to be a head coach. The guy did a really good job with Baylor, but they weren't winning any national titles. If teams are willing to take a chance on those guys, they will bring O'Brien in to give him a second chance. Now, they shouldn't give him any say in personnel. You want to listen to him? Fine. Make him feel like he's part of the conversation. But, if he says he wants to pick this guy, don't be beholden to that. If he says he wants to trade this guy... Don't be beholden to that. The Texans are not in a good spot right now. They have Deshaun Watson entering the prime of his career. J.J. Watt, who's just leaving the prime of his career. And Zach Cunningham, who's entering the prime of his career. And realistically... They're about three or five years away from a Super Bowl. That's on O'Brien. That's how far back he set this franchise from a transaction's perspective. Yeah, he had to go. A couple more points before I move on to the NBA Finals. The Texans are usually the model... Of consistency. They've been around since, you know, 2002. They've only had five head coaches in that time span. And only three full-time head coaches. Don Capers, Gary Kubiak, and Bill O'Brien. And the interims are Wade Phillips and uh, Romeo Cornell. And Cornell is the logical choice to become the interim head coach. He's been with the team since 2014. 
He knows the players. Been around the NFL for years. I don't mind him getting the interim job. I've seen Eric Bieniemy linked to the Texans when the season's over. He'd make perfect sense. Having said that, I really want him on the Jets. Either him or Lincoln Riley at this point. All right, now it's time to preview game four of the NBA Finals. If the Lakers are going to win this game, they need to be more careful with the ball. Make crisp passes. Don't give away possessions. Run your offense. Execute your sets. Don't get cute. Don't make crazy, flashy passes when you don't need to. Be smart with the basketball. There were some moments in Game 3 where LeBron was playing fast and loose with the ball, and the Heat took advantage of it. He had eight turnovers. Now, granted, the Heat didn't capitalize on a lot of those, but the point is the Lakers lost the opportunity to score. Even though they weren't giving up baskets on the other end, they gave up their own opportunity to score. They need to be more careful with the basketball. It's just that simple. As for the Heat, continue stifling Anthony Davis. The Heat were really physical in Game 3. Jay Crowder, I thought, did a really good job on AD. Yeah, he got into foul trouble early, but he made Davis work hard. And it paid off because Davis was dreadful in Game 3. And it's possible that Bam Adebayo can play tonight. Dragic, it doesn't seem like he's going to, but if Bam plays, that's another physical presence that AD's going to have to deal with. Play rough with AD, throw some elbows, make him work. I don't mind you playing physical. It paid off. All throughout the bubble, the Heat have done a great job defensively, and what they did in Game 3 against Anthony Davis is just another example of that. The Heat need to duplicate that tonight. There were some big hockey stories that broke, but I'm not going to talk about them. I really want to save them for a big hockey show that I'm going to do. I'm thinking Monday morning. NHL free agency starts on Friday because that's normal for it to start October 9th. There have been NHL seasons that have started on October 9th for certain teams. And now we're having free agency. Gotta love it. So my plan is to let the weekend pass. And then record a show Sunday night, breaking down the off season. For all 31 teams. And you'll get that Monday morning. Because NHL free agency usually moves lightning fast. You know within the first like 24 hours all the big moves. Yeah, there were some depth moves later. But the big guns tend to fly off the board really, really fast. I think that's going to happen here. I'm not going to talk about the NHL draft because I don't know a whole hell of a lot about the prospects. I know about Alexis Lafreniere. That's pretty much it. But tomorrow is going to be really special because I'm going to be talking to Paul Nepper about a book that he wrote about the 90s Knicks. That encompasses the whole decade from Ewing, Starks, and Oakley to Houston, Sprewell, 
and Johnson. And Ewing, too, because he was there for that second NBA Finals run that they had that decade. Should be fun talking to him, even though I'm a Nets fan. I'm going to power through it for you, because I think you'll enjoy the content. Until next time, I am Jacob Valk saying that the only time the Mets lose their concentration is when the umpire says, play ball.